You cannot attend a Pittsburgh Steelers game without seeing them. They are almost as synonymous with the city as the Immaculate Reception, Permani Brothers, and Sidney Crosby. I think it's great because no matter where you go, what city you visit, or out of state and everything, there's always Steelers fans everywhere. The iconic symbol of the Steelers fan base, seen twirling above tens of thousands of heads inside Akershore Stadium on any given Sunday. We think it would be a great idea. What began as a sign of support for the defending Super Bowl champions from WTA legend Myron Cope has become one of the most recognizable pieces of home field advantage in all of sports. Every time there's like a big stop and you see those all waving and uh, it's just a flurry wherever we go and it's, it's almost like a battle track. From its inception inside the halls of WTAE. Said to Myron, we need to get a promotion board. I want you to come up with some gimmick. Myron with that time, said, I'm not a gimmick guy. I've never been a gimmick guy. To providing comfort for families during their hardest moments. Very traditional uh, for families to bring the table towel in, to place inside the casket with their loved ones. To the ends of the earth. I have been in Ireland and seen a terrible towel. I have been in the Bahamas and seen a terrible towel. Tonight on Chronicle, the terrible towel. The place is Miami. Restaurants filled. Big spenders in time. Riff raff too. Ladies of the evening. Big talk from the Dallas Cowboys who don't seem to recognize that they're going up against perhaps the greatest dealer team of all. Who don't seem to recognize that they are also going up against a force as mysterious and deadly as the Bermuda Triangle. The terrible tower. Good evening, and welcome to Chronicle, The Terrible Towel. I'm Andrew Stocky. And I'm Janelle Hall. Behind us, Heinz Field, until recently, now Acroshore Stadium. It's a busy evening on the North Shore. Summer is winding down. Music is in the air, and people are enjoying the river walk. But it's feeling like fall with the new Steelers season underway. And just behind us, the Steelers faithful make their pilgrimage, towels in hand, to cheer on their beloved team. But the story is one of the most iconic pieces of cloth in sports history. And it starts about 10 miles down the Mon River, over the bridge, and through a tunnel. At this building on Ardmore Boulevard, our building that houses the studios and staff of WTAE. And it once was the home of WTAE Radio, where every night Pittsburghers turned up their radios to hear Myron Cope on sports. And the radio station no longer exists, and Myron, as many of you know, has since passed on. But 47 years ago, inside that building and inside his creative mind, Myron created a symbol that continues to be twirled today. The terrible towel as the subject of our Chronicle program tonight. The station general manager in WTA Radio was Ted Atkins, who was a brilliant uh, radio man, brilliant uh, promoter. And in 1975, the Steelers were headed to the playoffs for the first time as defending champions. He said to Myron, we need to get a promotion going. I want you to come up with some gimmick. And Myron who at that time said, I'm not a gimmick guy. He says he didn't want to do it, but I mean, he, they said that that was his assignment. He had to do it. His contract was up. They kind of like said, you got to do it. So he's like, oh, okay. This is the very first gold one. The oh, wow. And it used to be framed on our wall okay. with the black one. Here's another limited edition, 1979. Myron Cope's daughter, Elizabeth, has a collection of her father's famous towels today. But in 1975, she was just a child when Myron began to brainstorm. Something that like wouldn't be expensive, something that like wouldn't cause a lawsuit. Like if you hit somebody, no one would get hurt. Something easy to carry, something everybody had. He toyed around with different ideas when he was at home with us. And um, I remember saying that that was ter I would tell him ideas were terrible. And so in my mind, I think that's how he came up with the terrible towel, because I kept saying that's terrible. And you inspired the name? I think so. <laughs> I'm going to take credit. Once the towel was created, Cope took to the Pittsburgh Airwaves to sell it to a nation. Steeler Nation. But he employed the people he'd go on TV with spots to bring anything. Bring a bath towel, bring a wash rag, 
bring anything, bring a shirt and wave it. Cope also had to convince the guys they actually wore black and gold, like Rocky Blyer. At the beginning, it was like, really? <laughs> when he went into the, uh, the dressing room to get how the players felt about it, Andy Russell said to him, we're not a gimmick team. We're a great football team. On December 27th, 1975, Cope watched from the broadcast booth at Three River Stadium to see if his creation would catch on. He was just kind of like on the edge of his seat. And then when they got a touchdown, he said everybody like started waving like the towels and stood up and he said it was like a sight to behold. I thought the twirling looked pretty cool. You know what I mean? And, and, and like I thought, when you see a stadium full of twirling gold towels, that looked pretty awesome. The Steelers would go on to win another Super Bowl. The terrible towel would take hold through two more championships, eventually becoming the flag and fiber of Steeler Nation. So as far as being a gimmick and this, you know, sure, but that fit Myron. You know what I mean? And, and Myron promoted it, you know, and, and uh, talked about it and eventually you know, Swan and other players come running out, you know, you know, with the towel. But his daughter says it was just part of the fabric of what made Myron Cope as unique as a symbol he created. Oh, I mean, he, he was about a lot more than just the terrible towel. You know what I mean? But he didn't mind being known as the creator of it. No, he didn't mind. <laughs> The towel has gone from a creation inside the WTAE studios to a worldwide phenomenon. You can find terrible towels twirling across the country and even around the world. But the millions of dollars made from terrible towel sales, well, they've stayed right here in Pittsburgh. And in particular, one important place here in western Pennsylvania, a place one member of Myron Cope's family calls home. This is Danny. This is my brother. And um, he's a year and a half, two years older than me. So that's who he is, my dad's son. And he reminds me a lot of my dad, to be honest. He has a lot of his uh, mannerisms, and he was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, and he was blue. And uh, they told my parents when he was born, um, they did not know if he would be normal, if he wouldn't be normal. Danny Cope lives with autism. He has never spoken. But Myron's son found a home. <laughs> Here at Marikee Allegheny Valley School. It was a relief for him to um, know that my brother was going to be taken care of. They worried about that. Allegheny Valley School was founded in 1960 um, as a result of uh, there was a closing of the Pittsburgh Home for Babies and the last 10 kids that were left there that were unable to be placed all had mental retardation at that time was the terminology for IDD for intellectual and developmental disabilities. So actually the Allegheny Valley School grew out of those 10 individuals. Today it serves over 700 individuals statewide. The majority of our funding comes from Social Security, SSI benefits, um, but that is basic services, room and board, um, food, basic clothing items um, in order to really uh, build big, beautiful um, areas for our people to live and grow. Um, that takes extra money and extra fundraising. As Mary Key Allegheny Valley School faced financial challenges, Myron Cope was facing his greatest fear, involving his own son. I was like terrified that um, Danny, some, you know, he'd be homeless or like, God forbid, like if I passed away before Danny and like there's no family to take care, you know what I mean? Like what would happen to him? That led to a visit Myron made to then Allegheny Valley School CEO, Regis Champ. Our former CEO um, had been in his office one day in 1996 and Myron came into the into his office and said, hey, Reg, I want to give you the, this towel. And he's, oh, it's okay, Myron. I have, I have lots of towels, is how he stated it. And, uh, and Myron said, no, I want to I wanna give this to Allegheny Valley School, and he did. And since giving ownership to the school in 1996, the terrible towel has been the gift that just keeps on giving. So since that time, actually, Allegheny Valley School has benefited from $7.4 million in revenue for sale of the terrible towel. 7.4 million? Yes. Wow. I think that that is surprising because I think back in the 80s, it made like a couple hundred thousand. 
you know, and I don't think that my dad thought that it would like ever make as much as it did. What has that funding allowed you to do that otherwise you might not have been able to do? Oh, things like updating our homes, putting roofs on buildings. Um, we actually opened a home in Beaver County, the Coleman Group Home, um, which is a beautiful home for four individuals that we just opened in the last year and a half. To grow, you can see them. There is also the personal impact these extra dollars have made. If I were put in any other place, I probably wouldn't be as happy as I am in this place. This place is definitely made me the person I am today. Um, there's a lot I can do for myself independent-wise because I've lived here for so many years. These individuals share a special bond with a towel. And while they wave it with pride for the black and gold, they want you to know it means so much more. It's not just for the Steelers. I mean, they're waving it for the Steelers' pride and everything, but that they're making a difference in people's lives people like myself. The mission of the terrible towel is something that is definitely not lost on Steeler Nation. While millions have twirled the towel in support of the black and gold for decades, they too know about the deeper meaning behind one of the most well-known rally towels in professional sports. The terrible towel is at its worst now. It's about ready to put bad luck on you. From their impressions of Myron Cope. Coming to town this week, the eat. Mm, ah, dreaded clean brownies. Mm, ha. Yoy. Injury in upcoming games. To the moments they shared with the WTAE sports commentator, Steelers broadcaster, and creator of the terrible towel. Myron Cope uh, and the family, we, we all belong to Rolling Hills Country Club. And he was notoriously one of the worst golfers that has ever gone on any golf course anywhere in the world. And when you play Myron and you start to lose, he's happy. If you start to win, and you, you win almost every time, he put he brings the towel out and he waves the towel at you to curse you, so you'll you'll swing and miss at the golf ball, which is you don't do, but he does. Yeah. So, and it didn't work, by the way, because he was so bad. Not even the terrible towel could overcome his inability to hit a golf ball. Pittsburghers don't just remember the legendary Cope for his talents or maybe lack thereof on the golf course, but for what he gave to the Steel City. His voice, his sayings, his dedication to charity. It's a winner. It's a, it's a, it's a souvenir. It, it's, it's nostalgia. And it was done by a great guy, by Myron Cope. A piece of yellow cloth inspiring generations of Steeler fans. The fact that it goes to charity is just a great thing because, I mean, that shows it's more about the city, it's more about the town. It's not just about merchandise, it's not about revenue, it's about community. I especially love the fact that Myron Cope uh, trademarked the terrible talent so he could donate all the money to charity. Uh, charity is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'm partially inspired by Myron Cope. Myron Cope's creation serving as an iconic symbol of dedication to more than just the players on the football field. Terrible towel sales have benefited individuals with disabilities at the Allegheny Valley School since 1996. That just shows the spirit not only of the team, of the fans, the generosity that we have for people in need. How many teams try to copy this terrible towel, but there's only one terrible towel? Still ahead on Chronicle. We've had families uh, wave the terrible towel as we've persist into the cemetery. And then if you take it to the next level, for the ceremony, you know, we wanted to make sure that he had a towel in his hand in the casket. Mourners, flowers, and terrible towels. It may sound like an unusual combination, but to Pittsburghers, it's not that uncommon. And later... Don't tread on the terrible towel. When that happens, bad things happen to your team. No matter how many times Steeler Nation has warned the football world, the list of those who have dared continues to grow. <sighs> Fall is here, and you sure are busy, which means you need info and to get your people moving. <clears throat> Well, Ashley's on maternity leave. Casey and I will have your what to wear forecast. And Elena gets you from here to there with breaking traffic news from Sky 4. We'll take care of the information you need while you take care of them. All you need to start your day. Wake up and watch Pittsburgh's Action News 4. 
Evenings are busy and your time matters. That's why we bring you an accurate forecast to stay safe tonight. Greensburg, you're in the clear and plan your morning. Join us every weeknight for Pittsburgh's Action News 4 at 11. Breaking news alerts anywhere on the WTAE mobile app. It's a sight a lot of Pittsburghers are used to seeing babies wrapped in a terrible towel. Something you can see in almost any maternity ward at area hospitals. Starting the love for the Steelers at the beginning stages of life. It's a fabric that bonds so many of us here in Pittsburgh. And the terrible towel is also something that some families choose to incorporate into their final tributes after losing a loved one. When you're young and you start understanding football and what the Steelers mean to this town. For Corey O'Connor, Steeler football always meant family time and game days at Three Rivers Stadium with his dad. It's another way that like the terrible towel is connecting families and traditions and. Corey, the current Allegheny County controller, remembers his first terrible towel twirl at age 10. It was an AFC title game with his father, the late Pittsburgh mayor and city councilman Bob O'Connor. I stood on the chair and holding on to my dad and waving the towel in my right hand and it's just like oh we're all in this like battle together. Four months after Pittsburghers elected his father as the city's mayor, the Steelers won the Lombardi Trophy in Detroit. And Bob O'Connor proudly led the championship parade in downtown Pittsburgh while waving that terrible towel among a sea of Steeler fans. He was in his Pittsburgh glory. If there's a if there's a moment where you could capture him just to a T, what he's all about, it's waving the towel in the parade with, you know, a million people came to that parade. I think that was just something that he'll never, for, or we'll never forget. Sadly, seven months into his term, Mayor O'Connor died from complications of a rare brain cancer at the age of 61. For the ceremony, you know, we wanted to make sure that he had a towel in his hand in the casket, which I'm sure there's thousands of Steeler parents, grandparents, kids over the years that have done that. But I think that was really special because that's the symbol of the city. And as the mayor, you know, you are the symbol of the city. It's just a part of Pittsburgh. At the Bynauer Funeral Homes in the South Hills, it's no surprise to them when a family wants to honor a loved one with anything black and gold. Very traditional uh, for families to bring the terrible towel in to place inside the casket with their loved ones. We've had families uh, wave the terrible towel as we've processed into the cemetery. And then if you take it to the next level, uh, if you bring a terrible towel as a final tribute uh, to the family's loved one, having everyone place a terrible towel on top of the casket just prior to burial. At one Steeler fan's funeral service on the city's East End back in 2005, 55-year-old Army veteran James Henry Smith didn't want loved ones to see him in a traditional casket. He wanted his family to remember him the way they saw him on Steeler Sundays, in his recliner, with a remote in his hand, under a black and gold blanket, with a continuous loop of Steeler highlights playing on a nearby TV. If you're living in Pittsburgh, you're a native of Pittsburgh, or you're just a fan in general, the, the terrible towel really is the common thread. It's kind of been uh, the link between the Steelers, Pittsburgh, and its fan base. Well, my dad had given him a proclamation. And a link between loved ones, just like it was for Corey O'Connor and his family, towel. the day they paid their final respects to his father. Um, actually, oddly enough, the day of the funeral was the Steeler home opener that year. And uh, the Roonies were gracious enough, they allowed me to actually, right before kickoff, stand on the field and wave the terrible towel. Here I am on the day of his funeral, standing there with, again, 70 plus thousand people waving the towel in unison. It's kind of a, I, I don't even know how to describe the moment, but it's something like you can't believe you're in that moment. A city's final farewell while mourning the loss of its mayor in 2006. And a son saluting his father with a towel his dad taught him how to twirl. If anybody could do it, he asked me to do it because we attended so many Steeler games. So when those towels go up, he'll be watching from heaven. He'll be waving his. There are so many people, steel workers, 
you know, moms, dads that are buried with that flag because, or towel, because it's something that's so special to all of us. And we thought it was a good thing to add to, you know, his resting place that, you know, he'll always be with a terrible towel because he symbolized Pittsburgh and so does that towel. Still ahead on Chronicle, the pregame tradition that gets the whole stadium rocking. What it means to some of Pittsburgh's most famous faces to lead the terrible towel twirl. And later... And he said that terrible towel jinx us. Well, right then and there, I could just see Russell, if the Steelers lost the game, blaming it all on a terrible towel jinxing the Steelers, and that would be a catastrophe. Mess with the towel at your own risk, the mystique behind the towel known as the curse. That's later on Chronicle. Evenings are busy. Kids practice dinner with friends or putting extra hours in at work. Your time matters, and that's why this team is determined to get you caught up and ready for tomorrow. You're looking for an accurate forecast to stay safe tonight. Greensburg, this storm is moving out of your area. Plan your morning. Reporters who put in the work to bring you stories important to your neighborhood. Progress is underway at the site of the collapse. Join us every weeknight. For stories you'll see only on Pittsburgh's Action News 4 at 11. If there is one thing that Steeler fans know how to do, Janelle, it's how to twirl this towel. <laughs> and you know, about 12 years ago, the Steelers started a new tradition with their iconic symbol. And before every home game, special guests get to stand on the field and lead the entire stadium in the terrible towel twirl, something some of Pittsburgh's most well-known faces say is the thrill of a lifetime. 14 times, I just want to put that out there. I'm 13 and one. 13 and one. But who's counting? Comedian and actor Billy Gardell takes a lot of pride not only in being from Pittsburgh, but in his record whenever he's led the terrible towel twirl before a Steelers game. <laughs> and in a way only Billy could put it, with his favorite towel draped over his shoulder while wearing his favorite Steelers shirt, he says his first time taking on that role was a lifelong dream fulfilled. Now you gotta remember, I'm a, I'm a row house kid from Swissville, okay? And uh, Harrison Avenue. And uh, you know, we went out and played and your kids trying to go, you know, what are we gonna do? All right, well, let's get a ball and you know, we'll go two on two in the, in the street. And it was always, all right, I'm Bradshaw, you're Swan, or you know, I'm Mean Joe on defense here. You know what I mean? The stuff you do as kids. So to go from that to 36 years later, standing on the sideline of the place that brought you joy every week, the place that the place that brought your family together on Sundays. See, <laughs> I get a little emotional talking about it. I walked out on that field and I was speechless. I'm a guy that talks for a living. And I had no words. Then it took everything I had like now to hold back the tears of being in that place. That's how much this towel means to people. Here we go, Many who lead the twirl, like Billy, are celebrities with ties to Pittsburgh. Michael Keaton, Joe Manganiello, Wiz Khalifa. And another man who knows a thing or two about being in front of big crowds, Clarion native and former NSYNC member, Chris Kirkpatrick. The towel twirl is the thing where you start that up and it's like it's a release of energy and everybody in the in the whole stands and and I know I've I've played you know big crowds like that many times the energy that happens and that towel twirl that brings it all together is like unbelievable like it really feels like an out-of-body experience or like you just became a part of this mass and it kind of brings all the fans together it's not just celebrities who lead the twirl Steelers legends get their turn like mean Joe Green Brett Kiesel and Rocky Blyer the Steelers also invite members of the military people making an impact on the community and so many others to get the rush of a lifetime feel it. it's palpable 
it's palpable. It, it the noise and the energy they they rain down on you. Like you feel it. Like you you just get consumed in it. And then you completely forget that you're doing anything for a camera. You're just lost in the crowd with the crowd. You know what I mean? And whether you're leading the terrible towel twirl on the field or following along in the stands, you can't forget about the technique. When we went to the 05 Super Bowl against Seattle, they brought in these white towels because they knew we had the terrible towel. So they brought in these white towels. And man, that that game, like we were, my uncle and I were in our seats as soon as they opened the doors. I mean, we sat there for probably six hours watching the countdown, you know, waiting to see the Steelers in a Super Bowl. And um, I saw all these Seattle fans and they were just like all over the place with their towels. And then you see the Steeler fans and it's like, no, 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 there's a technique, baby. A technique Steelers fans will never forget. Just like it's hard to forget your first moments with the towel or the twirl. This was my first terrible towel twirl, and it was against the Jets. And it was on uh, Bettis' last year when he made the run to the Super Bowl. But this towel, I don't know if you know this, along with all the other towels in the city, is the reason the Jets' field goal was spoiled right here. This is the one. So if you want to, I'll give you a closer look. at it. It's pretty pristine because I keep it, you know. But that one right there. That's the reason we moved on into the playoffs right there. You know what the funny part is? I really believe that. And I know there's probably thousands of Pittsburghers who are going, yep, that makes sense. <laughs> Coming up on Chronicle, even those celebrities know not to mess with the towel. I don't know if it's <clears throat> Myron, like, just coming back and like empowering this but you know you don't tread on the terrible towel we explore one of the most well-known parts of the terrible towel the curse plus we have towels that we're not even allowed to touch fans know better than to mess with the mojo too the superstitions for steeler nation the one to turn to every morning. Pittsburgh's Action News 4. Thanks for waking up with us. Pittsburgh's number one most watched local news. Live breaking news. We have some breaking overnight news. In your neighborhood. Reporting live in Swissville. Then. Good morning, America. America's number one most watched morning show. Now we're going to get that breaking news overnight. There's only one to turn to every morning. A lot of people will be watching. I will be one of them. Pittsburgh's Action News 4. Weekday mornings starting at 4.30. Operation Football is back with an all-new season. All the big plays, bands, and rivalries. Only on WTAE, Pittsburgh's Action News 4 at 11.15. Hosted by WTAE Sports Director Andrew Stocky and introducing Action Sports Reporter Emily John Greco. Operation Football sponsored by Sea Harper Auto Group on WTAE, Pittsburgh's Action News 4, Fridays at 11.15. I think it was T.J. Hushmanzada from Cincinnati came in, wiped his feet with it. Suddenly, he was gone the next year. Imagine how that happened. So I, I wouldn't mess with the terrible towel. The terrible towel, in reality, is just a piece of cloth with no special powers. But Myron Cope saw it differently. He sure did with his creation. Cope explained what the terrible towel can and cannot do. Call it Cope's Creed. It's written on this terrible towel, and here's what it says in part. It is not an instrument of witchcraft. It is not a hex upon the enemy. The towel is a positive force that lifts the Steelers to magnificent heights and poses mysterious difficulties for the Steelers' opponents only if need be. But while the towel says it is not a hex, those mysterious difficulties have befallen the enemies who dare to desecrate the towel. Here's Ryan Recker with those who dared to tempt fate and the price they paid. 400 Ardmore Boulevard, the home of WTAE TV and at one time WTAE Radio. And here in December of 1975, a pair of radio executives and Steelers commentator and radio host Myron Cope entered a meeting. Soon after, the creation of the terrible towel 
was in motion. Well, in 1975, the last time that the Steelers had two playoff games at home, just prior to the first playoff game, a couple of vice presidents of our radio station, the two gents who uh, ran the radio station, called me in and they said, Myron, we're the station that broadcasts the Steeler games, and we think it would be a great idea if you would come up with some kind of gimmick for the fans for the playoffs. And uh, we think uh, by so doing, and if this is very successful, you could demonstrate to the people and to the advertisers uh, your influence with the public. So I said to them, I'm not a gimmick guy. I've never been a gimmick guy. And they said to me, your contract comes up for renewal in a few months. And I said, well, let me see if I can think of a gimmick. So uh, I thought, what, what is portable? What does everybody have? What can be easily carried to the station? It's functional, you know, serve a purpose. And I thought everybody has towels. Uh, you can bring a towel to the stadium, wipe your seat with it, throw it around your neck for a muffler against the cold. You can drop it over your head if it rains. And uh, I propose that we urge people to uh, bring a yellow or a gold or a black towel, Steeler colors, to the stadium. So the vice president sent out for champagne, and we drank to the terrible towel. And it was immediately accepted enthusiastically by the public. But a few days later, Andy Russell, he was the Steeler captain, you'll recall, he said to me, Myron, what is this nonsense about a terrible towel? That's a gimmick, and we're not a gimmick team. Hmm, well, that had a familiar ring to it. Those words did. And he said, that terrible towel will jinx us. Well, right then and there, I could just see Russell, if the Steelers lost the game, blaming it all on a terrible towel jinxing the Steelers. And that would be a catastrophe for our station. So I decided to overcome his objection by taking a Democratic poll of the Steelers squad. And I managed to get a majority for the terrible towel by uh, bearing down particularly hard on backup little-known players who uh, thought it would be useful to get a little publicity for a change. Anyhow, the terrible towel carried the vote. Uh, the Steelers went on to go all the way. Miraculous things happened, like Andy Russell running 93 yards with the Baltimore fumble. And the towel has continued to work its miracles when brought back this season. That was in January of 1979, leading up to Super Bowl XIII in Miami and a Steelers rematch with the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I'm a Steelers fan. I've always been a Steelers fan. The Cowboys featured a familiar face to Pittsburghers who, during the buildup, playfully downplayed the Terrible Towel's existence. You uh, haven't heard of the Terrible Towel? No, I haven't. What, what the hell is it? <laughs> the Terrible Towel. That's a new one. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what it is. That's Gargonzola. Dorsett was in Pittsburgh in 75 when the towel last flew and performed its miracles. And Dorsett just asked me about the towel about a week ago. Why, well, maybe he's pretending that it doesn't exist, thinking that if he so pretends, the towel will go away and not affect his performance. Yeah, it's nothing but bravado. The Steelers went on to beat the Cowboys and claim their third Super Bowl title. Tony Dorsett's dismissal was an early example of what has become known as the curse of the terrible towel. Over the years, opponents have disrespected the towel, only to have it backfire. Like in 2005, when the Bengals' T.J. Hushmanzada wiped his feet with the towel. And later that season, the Steelers beat the Bengals in the playoffs on their way to winning the Super Bowl. And in 2008, some members of the Titans stomped and spit on the towel. The top-seeded Titans were then promptly upset in their first playoff game. The Steelers went on to win their sixth Super Bowl. And a season later, during an 0-6 start, Titans head coach Jeff Fisher was left begging for forgiveness. I need to know about the mystery of this terrible towel because um, last December a couple of my knuckleheads stomped on it and we haven't won a game since. <laughs> <laughs> so will you tell the Roonies that I have one enshrined in my office, I have one hanging in, in my house and I'll put one on the prowl. I'll do anything I need to do with that towel. As a gesture and as a way to try and reverse the curse, the Titans sent autographed towels to the Allegheny Valley School, which benefits from sales of the terrible towel. For nearly five decades, it has haunted opponents 
and served as a symbol of the Steelers. The Steelers had their 12th man in the WTAE radio booth in the old... And while many times imitated, and so the terrible the tau, just like its creator, is one Steelers. of a kind. This is Myron Cope on sports. Even the inventor acknowledged its power, though he swore it wasn't some kind of black magic. The legacy of the curse is hard to argue with. Real or not, Steeler fans believe and they take their towels seriously. Steeler fans are funny. This has all its signature, all these signatures on it, so I bring it um, whenever I go to games as my lucky towel. And I haven't been to a game without this where we lost. Doesn't matter who you ask. We have towels that we're not even allowed to touch. We wave them at the home, but, but sometimes they can go to the games or some they can't go to the games. Everyone thinks they have a magical power, like they control the outcome. Sat in the wrong spot on the couch, well, that explains the interception. Got up for a snack, touched down bad guys. And while that may or may not be true, one extraordinary piece of memorabilia has a power beyond comprehension. We have a couple of the original yeah. Myron Cope towels. And they stay at home. They never go out. They come out during games and are laid on top of the TV. Celebrity Steeler fans are superstitious, too. Billy Gardell grew up in Swissvale. He now lives in L.A., but inside the walls of his home are Pittsburgh values and Steeler superstitions. My grandmother was also, she wasn't, she wasn't waving the towel on every play. She was not about that. And she, she would always say, you don't, listen, let the boys play. We only wave this when we need to help them. She goes, plus, <laughs> she would go, this is, this is a, a woman talking to me with conviction. She, she would say, she goes, you don't want to use it too much because you'll wear the energy out of it. And it's a long game. And so, uh, and then she had a towel, she had a towel for uh, the regular season and she had a towel for the playoffs. And then, uh, and then I, I kind of picked up those habits over the years. We'll be walking through, you know, Giant Eagle, Walmart, and they're like, I probably made that. Terrible Towel Production, back in the Berg. It started in Wisconsin, but ahead on Chronicle, we're taking you to the south side to the new exclusive home of Towel Creation. And later, the tears, family, and tradition surrounding that yellow piece of cloth. It's a sign of a winner. You'll never see this anywhere else, how they do it in Pittsburgh. The true reason fans say while you may leave Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh never leaves you. Myron Cope's original plea to the football fans of Pittsburgh, bring any towel or dish rag you can find lying around the house to the stadium. The flag of Steeler Nation has come a long way since 1975. It comes in all styles, sizes, and colors, but it's only made in one place, appropriately a place right here in Pittsburgh. The biggest symbol of Steeler Nation, produced in the smallest of places. Little Earth Productions on the South Side Slopes. But this is a relatively recent development. The terrible towel used to actually be made out of Wisconsin, home of the Packers, and nobody was ever very thrilled about that. So they got sold to a different company, and at that point, the Steelers said, well, Little Earth Productions is now an NFL licensee, so this is a great opportunity to move the terrible towel to Pittsburgh, where it rightfully belongs. Little Earth has been making NFL licensed accessories since 2008. But since 2014, it has been the exclusive home to Myron Cope's terrible towel. This is where the magic happens. This is the headquarters of Little Earth Productions, and we're in our terrible towel production area. And this is how it happens. As we get in blank gold towels, mm -hmm. and then we design and we have manufactured special heat transfers. This one's the Got Rings. And our production people, like James here, use these special machines that are the exact size for the towels. We heat them on, then you have to quickly pull the transfer off. And that's it. And that's, that's it. That's, that's perfect. That will last. You can throw it in the wash, okay. although, you know, most people don't wash their towels. <laughs> When August rolls around, it's pretty busy. We probably do 10, 15,000 a week at some point. Production manager Tracy Schaefer says that adds up to a quarter million towels in a normal year. Are you busier when the team is doing better? Much, much. During a playoff run, they could produce a half million. During a Super Bowl run, perhaps as many as one million. 
And we're not just talking about your basic terrible towel here. Halloween is coming up. Yeah. This is a special towel that glows in the dark. What? So, <laughs> so we developed this special heat transfer, and when you put it in a dark area, it'll glow for a while. Dal Bunny is a part of the graphics design team. Taking Myron Cope's creation into directions the late Steeler broadcaster could never have imagined. I'm old enough to remember Myron Cope on the uh, radio, so listening to him and um, having one of the more original towels. Um, it's nice to kind of see the progression and to kind of get to play around with it and put a nice creative spin on it. And working with the Steelers, new towels are on the way, like this one, created to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. While the physical look of the terrible towel has not changed, now that it's made in Pittsburgh, there's a new pride that everyone in this shop shares. A couple of my kids are 16, 17 now, and they come in and work for me in the summer. And we'll be walking through, you know, Giant Eagle, Walmart, and they're like, I probably made that. Myron Cove is such a legend in the, in the city, and um, I've grown up a Steelers fan and uh, been to a lot of games and followed them for as long as I can remember. So being able to do something with the city, the team, uh, there's definitely a lot of pride that goes with it. It's amazing that it's made right here in this building in Pittsburgh, and I take a lot of pride in that. Still ahead on Chronicle. I think it's great because no matter where you go, what city you visit or out of state and everything, there's always Steeler fans everywhere. So. It's great. You put your, your magical Steeler things on that shelf, like my, my this towel's up there. I have, uh, you know, my little uh, my baubles. Dedication in all its glory. How the terrible towel embodies everything Steeler fans love about their team and their city. The fans who pack the stadium every time the Steelers play share something in common, more than most other professional sports teams, dedication. It's a dedication to the team, the city, and the Pittsburgh way of life. As Ryan Recker explains, it's something this little bit of cloth embodies to all who hold it. In 1975, he was told to create a gimmick, something to excite the fans. 47 years later, it's bringing fans to tears, uniting an entire city, and reaching far beyond Steeler Nation. We went to a church, Catholic church, and, and it was a big game, and uh, there was a terrible towel on the altar. On the altar. <laughs> Steeler fans are everywhere. I mean, I'm a, you know, walking, breathing example. I mean, being in Florida, coming up here, coming to the shop. I mean, seeing terrible towels in stadiums is just one of the coolest things in the world to me. The first time I came to Pittsburgh, right, the first time I've ever seen the wave brought tears to my eyes. I swear to God, it was something special. Everybody has towels. Myron Cope's idea for the terrible towel started as a group of people waving old dish towels. Today, they're waving them with a certain technique, managing to curse opponents and giving other professional teams something they wish they had. If you're a Steeler fan, you've had that moment. You've, you've had that moment where it's the other team's got the ball and it's third and two and you absolutely have to stop them or they're going to be in field goal range or they're going to get into the end. And you start waving that towel and then something magically happens on defense. Now, to normal outsiders, they go, oh, well, they just stopped them. But we know what happened. We understand as a city, as a family, as a tribe, we know it was the power of the towel. Whether Pittsburghers are at church or grandma's house, floating around space or going to the Great Wall of China, the loyalty to the towel and the team never seems to fail, even when Pittsburgh natives call a new city home, like Nashville. We have such a love for the city and for the city teams that, um, you know, we moved here and the Penguins were playing the Predators in the Stanley Cup. And when the Steelers play the Titans, it, it, it's it's the same thing. It's it's always wow. I've I've gone all year and watched the Predators play and love the Predators. I've gone all year and watched the Titans play and I love the Titans. But Steelers come in and it becomes 
you know, home versus heart. And, you know, the heart always wins out. The terrible towel is part of Steelers history. I think of winning Super Bowls. I really do. I mean, that's when it was brought out. When, uh, back when uh, you had this guy <laughs> and Franco and Swan and Stallworth that came out of the field doing this. It's a, it's a sign of a winner. It's what makes Pittsburgh unique. That's why the other players are yeah. mad and they try to like disrespect the towel. Like they're just mad that they don't have what we have. They want terrible towels on their on their TVs <laughs> in their hometowns and they don't Original got that. Ones. A sea of black and gold and those yellow towels wherever you go. This is where it started in Pittsburgh. You'll never see this anywhere else. How they do it in Pittsburgh. When you're in Pittsburgh, and especially when you live in the city or around the city, it just engulfs you. When you're out around the country, you know, you leave Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh doesn't leave you. No better way to sum it up than that. You may leave Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh never leaves you. When we come back, we leave you the same way we started tonight with Myron Cope talking about the towel in his own words. Welcome back to Chronicle. For the last hour, we've told you some of the best stories about the terrible towel. From its creation at WTAE to its profound impact on the lives of Steeler fans and Pittsburgh. But we are well aware there is no amount of time in an episode of Chronicle to fully convey what this piece of cloth really means to fans and the city. So we invite you to keep sharing your stories with us and pictures of how you show your dedication with your towels. And we leave you tonight with another gem of a story from the towels creator himself. Myron Cope about how he helped cement the towel into Steelers lore. On behalf of the entire Chronicle team, I'm Andrew Stocky. And I'm Janelle Hall. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. Andy Russell, and he was the Steeler captain, you'll recall. He said to me, Myron, what is this nonsense about a terrible towel? That's a gimmick, and we're not a gimmick team. Hmm, well, that had a familiar ring to it, those words did. And he said, that terrible towel will jinx us. Well, right then and there, I could just see Russell, if the Steelers lost the game, blaming it all on a terrible towel jinxing the Steelers, and that would be a catastrophe for our station. So I decided to overcome his objection by taking a Democratic poll of the Steelers squad. And I managed to get a majority for the terrible towel by uh, bearing down particularly hard on backup little-known players who uh, thought it would be useful to get a little publicity for a change. Anyhow, the terrible towel carried the vote. Uh, the Steelers went on to go all the way. So that's how it all began. And here we are and seeing how it will this time around finish.